All right, good morning, everybody. I'm Craig Young, and I'm going to talk to you about Zombie Poodle, Golden Doodle, and how TLS 1.3 can save us all. So uh, a little bit about me for a second. I'm the principal security researcher with Tripwire Vert, and so I develop content for the Tripwire IP360 vulnerability scanner, particularly uh, various remote checks. I'm also an InfoSec trainer. I'm going to be training at Black Hat USA this year, as well as the Sector Conference in Toronto. Uh, but most importantly, I'm a hacker, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is some of the research I've done in that capacity. So what we'll talk about here, I'm going to go over a little bit of the basics of how TLS works and CBC mode encryption specifically. Uh, we'll look at how padding oracles get exploited, how to scan for padding oracles, and specifically how I was able to make my own tool for scanning for padding oracles that were previously unknown. We'll then go over the, some of the findings that I had, including Zombie Poodle and Golden Doodle, and wrap it all up by telling you how TLS 1.3 is going to be your savior. So at a basic level, everybody should know that TLS is a protocol for being able to establish some private communication channel between two untrusted peers across an untrusted link. So the way this starts is that a client is going to send out a client hello message. The hello message is going to contain a list of cipher suites that the client says, I speak these ciphers and I have these protocols that I support. The server is going to respond by selecting a protocol version and a cipher suite. But what is this cipher suite exactly? So this is a set of algorithms that are going to define the secure communication for the TLS protocol. So namely, you're going to have a, an algorithm for key exchange and authentication message encryption, and also message authentication. For the purposes of this talk, though, we're going to be looking at message encryption. Uh, this is because we're looking at how to decrypt packets from HTTP sessions. So obviously, the encryption and the decryption are going to be the most relevant. So to talk about that, we need to understand cipher types. So we've got block ciphers and stream ciphers. Stream ciphers would be like your RC4, ChaCha20. Um, but your block ciphers are what we're talking about today. And the ones that everybody should be familiar with are AES and DES in this regard. What I mean by a block cipher is that it's only going to operate on fixed length blocks. So for DES, you've got 64-bit blocks. For AES, you've got 16-byte blocks, 128 bits. And if you have less than a block, you're going to need to fill it with some extra data. That data is referred to as padding. When you have more than one block of data, however, you're going to need to define a mode of operation for the cipher. So there are a few of these existing, um, CBC, ECB, electronic code book, counter mode. But the one that we're focusing on today is CBC, or cipher block chaining. Uh, you can see kind of a diagram of how this works. Uh, this is borrowed from Wikipedia. Basically, though, as you encrypt, you're going to be binding things back through XOR with the previous ciphertext in a chain. Um, we'll get into that in more detail. The block diagram is a little confusing. So an example of how this works. Let's say we've got an HTTPS request. Um, it's this basic GET request. We're going to use AES encryption for it, so it means that we've got 16 byte blocks that we're going to be dealing with. And I've set aside a matrix of eight of these blocks uh, as a prediction of how much data we'll need. So first, we'll fill in the request. We give this color to indicate these are the actual plain text bytes that are going to go up to the application. And now we're going to need to authenticate this. So we calculate a hash. The hash is called a message authentication code. And in this case, it's 20 bytes because we're talking about AES with SHA. Um, after we've done this, we now see we've got an even number of blocks. It's divisible. So you might think, well, do we actually need to pad this message? It will work with our CVC mode encryption. The answer is definitively yes, because if you don't, you're going to have ambiguity when you unpack this. When you decrypt this, you won't know where is the MAC or is this padding at the end. And that's because the last byte, it's, the last byte of the plain text is actually a padding length specifier. Now, this byte, it's not actually considered padding. It's a padding length. So you can see that I've filled out in that block 0xf, or 15. 
which is because there are 16 blocks, or 16 bytes rather, one of them is your padding length, and so then we need 15 more bytes of padding. So what value are we going to put in for this padding? Well, if it's SSLV3, it's just going to be random data. Uh, it can be any non-determinist bytes, the standards just didn't specify that. In TLS, however, uh, meaning starting with TLS1 up till current, well, you're going to pad this with a determined value. So the padding length byte is going to be repeated for each of the padding bytes. And this is rather important, but we'll see about that a little bit later. So back to our example, we're now going to follow the TLS model. And I've padded out 15 bytes of the hex F, um, which gives us our complete message. Now we want to send this through for CBC mode encryption. And as you can see, what's happening here is we're going to start with an initialization vector. The initialization vector is not actually shown here, um, but it would either for SSLV3 be CBC residue, meaning like the last thing that was being decrypted, the last block is going to end up being an input here, or in newer protocols, it's going to actually be explicitly set at the beginning of your message. So you'll have this initialization vector that gets XORed against the first block of the plain text and then encrypted through the block cipher. The output from that is then going to be used to XOR with the next block of the plain text before going into the encryption and so on until we've encrypted the entire message. So if we want to decrypt this, obviously it's a pretty trivial reversal. So on the encryption side, we're XORing and then encrypting. So to decrypt, we need to first decrypt and then XOR. The process here, this is called MAC, then pad, then encrypt. And this is what cryptographers refer to as malleable encryption. And the reason for that is that the use of XOR in this way allows for targeted plain text manipulation and the fact that the message isn't necessarily fully authenticated. Uh, so basically what this means is that if you were to flip a bit within a particular ciphertext block, it's going to flip a corresponding bit in the next in the plain text of the next ciphertext block, if that makes sense. We'll see this illustrated out in a minute, um, but what you do have to understand here is you can make this targeted change, but of course you've now modified a ciphertext that's going to have random results, so you will have data before your targeted manipulation getting corrupted. Uh, it will be unpredictable. Now, back in 2002, Sergei Vodne uh, wrote a paper about padding oracle attacks and recognized that this was not a good process, this Mac, then pad, then encrypt. And unfortunately, the TLS designers did not really heed this warning because TLS 1.1 came out a few years later, still doing the same thing. TLS 1.2, 2008, still has Mac, then pad, then encrypt CBC mode encryption. Now, back to these padding oracles. Um, what I mean by a padding oracle is that the server is going to reveal something to the, vic to the attacker uh, about the plain text that's being processed or something about the cipher text that's being processed. So some of the things that an attacker might look for would be, can you tell if this message being received by the server has valid padding? Does it have a valid Mac? Is it possible that you can know that the value is within a certain range or in other words, that a specific bit has been set with it? And even sometimes if it's just leaking out the amount of plain text that's there, that can allow an attacker to work backwards and develop some attacks. In general, when you've got a padding oracle, the risk is an adaptive chosen ciphertext attack. Uh, there is a caveat there. Um, the attacker has to be able to actually observe what's going on in the server. So this means that if the server is responding differently to different uh, broken messages, it's only going to matter if those messages or if those differences are visible to the attacker. So encrypted TLS alerts, that's not necessarily going to be distinguishable by the attacker readily. It's possible that through some browser tricks you might be able to. Um, another thing to mention is that timing attacks work like Lucky 13, uh, but this is not necessarily the most practical when you're talking about an attack over the internet because there's a lot of fluctuation of latency. You can't always know where it's coming from 
whether it's coming from a variation in the server's algorithm or something else. But generally speaking, if the attacker is able to either observe this change by sniffing on the wire or by being within the victim's browser, then there's the potential for this attack. So to explain this, to further elaborate, I'm going to go through the case study of how Poodle worked. Um, so we'll talk about the original Poodle vulnerability, which is affecting SSLv3. The requirements for somebody to exploit this attack, you would need to be a man in the middle attacker. You're going to need to have a server that's running SSLv3 with CBC mode cipher support. And you need to find a victim that's actually logged into this site with some authentication, like meaning it's sending cookies or it's sending a base64 encoded passphrase or some other header with a hash in it that's going to authenticate it. The first step in the attack is going to be that the man in the middle will need to downgrade the connection to SSLv3. I'm not going to get into the details on that. If you want to know more about that, Google TLS fallback dance and you'll get a lot of good information. But effectively, that's a well-known problem and it is also a well-resolved problem. So the next step in this attack, though, is that the attacker is going to need to get some JavaScript running in the browser of their victim. It doesn't need to be in the origin of the website that they're trying to attack. It can just be any origin, because we just need to be able to use JavaScript to generate out some requests that are going to include the credentials and where the attacker is able to control some attributes of the request, like either uh, amounts of data or types of data that are in the request. Now, once these requests are generated onto the wire, the attacker is going to actually kind of move them around. So they'll know the offset of some data that they're looking for in the HTTPS request, and they're going to take that block of ciphertext and copy it over to be the last block of ciphertext, meaning it's going to be replacing the padding. Uh, the resulting record from that is going to be sent off to the server looking something like this. So you can see here that ciphertext block four is the one that corresponds with plain text block four, and that's the one that has our cookie value in it. So the attacker is going to take that, copy that in place of uh, C7 there, and send this along to the server. Now, when the server decrypts this, obviously uh, that last block, it's going to end up being pseudo-random data because you're taking some uh, decryption intermediate value and XORing it with these MAC bytes. Um, you can see the equation for what those pseudo-random bytes would be. It's the decryption of C4 with the XOR against C6. So the attacker is going to watch what the server does. If the server sends a TLS alert, that means that the padding was invalid because um, the padding length ended up not being correct, so the MAC was not correct, and the server rejects the message. If there is no TLS alert, however, then it's going to look something like, oops, sorry, this is a decryption error. So yeah, here you can see actually, um, if the decryption, in most cases, it's going to end up that that last byte, that padding length, is not going to line up correctly. So you can see here that we've got padding length 14, and when we strip away some bytes for that, it's ultimately going to affect the way that the server is interpreting what the MAC bytes were, and that MAC will be incorrect. This is going to happen about once out of every 256 times, it will not have an error. Um, so you can kind of think of the poodle attack as being, for each byte you're trying to decrypt, you're rolling a die with 256 sides and you're hoping that it comes up on the number 15 or eight if you're working with DES. Uh, on the successful case, however, we randomly end up having that hex F, 15, is our padding length. So now the packet's able to be properly parsed out. The MAC address make, or uh, the MAC value makes sense. And so now the attacker does not get an alert and they can make an inference about the data. They can actually now decrypt the byte that was the last byte from that one ciphertext block. So you can see how this works here. We're going to take that 15 and XOR with the previous ciphertext block in order to find out what the intermediary decryption value was for that last byte from the targeted ciphertext block. From there, we can then know what the plain text value is by taking that intermediary value and XORing it again with C3's last byte. 
Uh, hopefully this is clear. So now from this point, the attacker has decrypted one byte and they're going to have to adjust the request. So meaning if they add on some bytes to the URL and maybe add or remove some bytes to an extra header that comes after the cookie, they can keep it aligned that the bytes from their cookie are going to continuously fall into that uh, expected location where the attacker can try and recover it. So again, the reason that this is working is because of the Mac, then pad, then encrypt. Uh, there is no authentication over the padding bytes within SSLv3. This was a flaw within the protocol design and uh, it was corrected with TLS. So now that TLS uh, specifies padding bytes, we really shouldn't have any more Poodle problems. Everything should be good. But back at the time when Poodle was disclosed, other people got the idea, hey, you know, you could just use SSLv3 on pad mechanism in a TLS implementation and that would have this problem too. So several people made some tools and started scanning the internet and found, yeah, there were several vendors that were for some reason using the SSLv3 on padding functionality within TLS connections. So the result that we have here is Poodle is exploitable again. But these are not protocol flaws. These are implementation flaws. So patches come out and everybody should be good, right? Well. Maybe, but maybe not. So Poodle TLS is specifically this problem of the SSL on pad function being used in TLS. So the way that people would test for this is obviously to just take a client, make the client use the SSL v3 padding functionality and see if you're able to connect to the server. If you're able to connect to the server using that SSL v3 padding mechanism, it means that the server has not actually validated the padding on your finished message, which probably means that they're just using that SSL v3 on padding function. The problem with this test, I mean, so correct, this test is good for Poodle. The problem with it is that it doesn't match the reality of what an attack looks like. Uh, as you saw in the workflow that we went through there, there was no mention of altering a finished message. In the real attack, the attacker is going to allow that finished message to flow, allow the connection to be established, and then they're going to start uh, messing with the connection after it's applicationed out on the line. So this brought a few questions to mind. Namely, are there actually stacks out there, TLS stacks that is, where they're going to behave differently if I am messing up the padding after the handshake as opposed to before or during the handshake? And I was also curious because I had previously done this research on uh, Blankenbacher oracles and we found that there were a number of other side channels that people hadn't really been looking at like connection signals and whatnot. So I was curious about whether CBC padding oracles would also have uh, ability to be exploited through less known side channels. And finally, of course, I wanted to know if this is actually a problem on the internet today. So this is 2019. We've been talking about CBC padding oracles for 17 years now. So ideally, there shouldn't really be much of anything on the internet that still has this. But to find out, I needed to build a new tool, come up with some new test cases, and then do some scanning of top ranked sites. So some internet top lists. In order to get started with the tool, uh, I had remembered back to when Poodle had first come out and I had found on the Imperial Violet blog a very cool proof of concept from Adam Langley where he patched the crypto TLS library within Go and basically just told that to have a flag to say, all right, use broken padding. And this was pretty effective for finding Poodle TLS exposures. Um, all I needed to do from there really was to make the change a little bit less aggressive. So rather than just always using this broken padding mode, had to figure out a way to actually recognize on the connection when there's application data as opposed to handshake data. The next thing that I was thinking about is how to distinguish the different error states. So one of the things we looked at in robot was the amount of data that was coming back. Some servers would send two TLS alerts rather than one TLS alert for certain errors. And also it's possible like with Poodle that you're going to get data back even though there were padding errors and that's going to tell you something. And another big one is TCP headers. So 
how is the connection being established? Is it being torn down with a reset, a fin? Is the socket just being left open? Maybe you've got something else like a push flag that comes up in random places. But again, whatever uh, errors that we find, they do need to be observable at some point for this to actually be exploitable. So I'm going to tell you about the test cases that I chose in a minute, but first to understand what the test cases are. This means that we're going to complete a handshake and then we're going to send an HTTP request where the padding has been broken in specific ways based on these test cases. We're then going to observe and record how the system responded and, you know, did the socket abort? Did it allow me to just time out? Um, the, from each test case, the results are going to be compared and it should be that for a secure server, any error that I throw at it, I'm not going to be able to tell the difference of why it triggered that error. So if I do see something that can be distinguished, I'm going to assume that that is a vulnerability. Um, like I said though, inconsistent responses, uh, they might not be exploitable. Um, so something that I do to help improve the accuracy of the scans is I assume that all hosts need to be triple checked. That if you don't get the same exact responses from a host after three rounds of sending each test case, that you should consider this interesting but not necessarily vulnerable because in reality an attacker is probably not going to be able to do much with that. So the test cases that I started out with um, when I started this project in August 2018, we've got four test cases to cover um, basic scenarios that I thought about that could affect these. So we'll go through these one by one. Um, well, actually in a second we'll, so after August, uh, I spent some time working on this. I found some bugs in my code, fixed some problems with edge cases related to certain ciphers being selected. And I also expanded my knowledge about padding oracles. I learned more about the beast attack and I learned from colleagues at Rohr University Bochum about uh, an open SSL flaw involving a zero byte record. And finally, I challenged some of the assumptions that I made about how these things work. And I came up with an additional test case and also expanded some of my other test cases. So in the end, we'll talk about data sets of my scans. Um, this is the March scan set. Uh, those first four test cases is what will be described as the initial scans. So for the test cases, this first one is going to be having valid padding, but an invalid Mac. Now, the reason this is valid padding is because it ends with a zero. What that means is that there's zero length or zero bytes needed for padding and the server is just going to interpret the rest of the bytes or the 20 or however many is appropriate for this particular cipher number of bytes as Mac values. Uh, so that's not going to be right. Obviously, the chances of that ending up being a valid Mac are infinitesimally small. So we can assume that this is invalid Mac with valid padding. Uh, the second test case that I thought about was what happens if the server receives a message but it doesn't actually have enough bytes to unpack it. So we send, say, an 80-byte message, but we say there's 255 bytes of padding. How is it going to respond? And also just as a note, initially um, I did implement this as just having the last block as all Fs, but when I came back to this in March and expanded on my work a little bit, I ended up realizing that you really could, as an attacker, create multiple blocks of crafted text and so I extended out this test case to be filling up the entire record with all Fs. So it is true, incomplete, invalid padding without any record and without any Mac. The third test case is just basically your poodle test case. We've got SSLv3 style padding uh, where the server will not be able to validate the bytes. And test case number four is going to be having a missing Mac. So that means the padding length is going to be exactly the length of the record. And once again, initially in March, I started out just by doing the last block because that's what a poodle attacker would do. With the increased knowledge of Beast, um, I ended up expanding this so that all of the blocks would have this value so that it would actually be valid padding um, rather than incomplete padding. And then finally, 
The last test case that's in here, I can't really take credit for this one because this came from uh, Yuri Samarovsky, Robert Murgit, and Nimrod Avram, um, who I collaborated with on some research. But basically the idea here is that we've got a zero length record. So we're leaving enough data that there is a Mac and padding, but nothing else. And this can trigger some problems with certain OpenSSL builds. So I put all these test cases into my tool and I started scanning the lab at Tripwire to see what would come up. I found a lot of targets. Uh, I validated my results against the Tripwire IP360 tool and found that things were as expected, except one. One thing stood out, the Cisco ASA that had CV 2015-4458. Uh, this should not have had Poodle, but it was matching my thing. So I looked into this bug and found that it had been previously found and called MACE. Um, basically, it's, the problem was that the Cavium network accelerator in this device was having MAC validation disabled. Now, I look at this bug and I see a classic padding oracle, but MITRE looked at this bug and they said, could allow man in the middle attackers to spoof TLS content. Cisco, uh, they were more direct in saying, a successful exploit of this vulnerability does not allow an attacker to decrypt the packets. And I saw this as a challenge and I took that challenge. So to me, um, you should be able to exploit this pretty similar to Poodle. So you've got a man in the middle, you've got a victim that's using CVC ciphers and ultimately you're going to be able to steal some uh, secret information like a session cookie or an authentication header of some other sort. The difference is that Golden Doodle, um, as I'm going to name this, is much faster than Poodle because the decryption is deterministic as we'll see in a moment. So the trick here is that because the Mac bytes are not being validated, we're actually able to set a guess in that block that I've labeled G there and use that to influence the decryption so that we can actually validate whether or not a guess that we have for a particular plain text byte is correct. So in that way, we can iteratively go through all possible characters and brute force decrypt this. Um, so you can see there the equation for how we're calculating this, but basically um, we're going to guess the plain text value and use that by XORing with the previous ciphertext to come up with what would have been the block cipher decryption output from this uh, targeted ciphertext block if our guess was correct. Now using that, we basically just fix that value into our guess spot and if it ends up that our guess was correct, then these numbers are going to cancel out because you're going to be XORing something against itself that gives you zero, which is going to be your valid padding. So you can see here, um, this is what it would look like if our guess is correct. You've got the padding length being zero, the Mac is wrong, but the server doesn't care. So as I was saying, the attacker is going to now be able to, for each intercepted request, make a guess or validate a guess for what one targeted byte is. Uh, this means that as opposed to Poodle where you've got an average of 256 requests for every byte, with Golden Doodle, any byte could be decrypted in at most 255 requests. And frankly though, because HTTP is a plain text protocol, you're limited to these printable ASCII characters, 95 of them, which means that you've really only got 94 maximum requests that you're going to need to do before you know any byte that might be realistically found within an HTTPS packet. And there's also other interesting cases like this Cisco ASA, for example, the web VPN mode on it, it uses a hexadecimal session ID, um, all with lowercase, I think it is, letters. So in that case, you're talking about 15 requests for each byte that you're trying to decrypt. So I made a proof of concept of this. It went very easily. I did it in Python using IP tables. It wasn't like a full realistic exploit scenario, but rather just having curl being the victim, running it in a loop and redirecting my traffic through IP tables to my script. Um, I tested this on the SSL VPN interface from an ASA running 9.1 subversion six, and it did in fact work. So 
The next finding that I had while I was looking through this is called zombie poodle. This is again not poodle, but it is similar. So poodle again is specifically when you're talking about the use of the SSLV3 padding mechanism in TLS. This is something different. Um, what's happening here is you're looking for any types of signals that are going to indicate that non-deterministic padding um, and use those with an algorithm that is the same as Poodle, except the Oracle is going to be different. So the way that I look at this for at least the most common zombie Poodle, it's almost like an inversion of the Poodle Oracle. So with Poodle, you're looking for an alert, and when that alert happens, it means that your data was not good. When the alert is not there, your data was good, a positive Oracle response. But with zombie poodle, in other words, you've got it that when you get an alert, it actually is oftentimes telling you that your, your Oracle was positive. Uh, so I turned my scanner on to the Alexa top 1 million, and I did this because most of the popular stacks that exist on the internet are going to be found within the Alexa top list here. And there's, at this point now, like 85% of the hosts actually do have HTTPS running. And as luck would have it, I had previous data sets from doing research into the Bleichenbach oracles um, last year on robot research. So I was able to correlate a lot of this data and kind of get a sense for what vendors might be out there. The first scans that I did um, were conducted between August and December 2018. And I was able to identify a hundred different behaviors among all of the targets. Um, a lot of these were like one-offs or two-offs, meaning you would have just this one server happens to have an EOF for this one error, none of the others do. But there were actually 46 of them that appeared on at least 10 servers. Um, overall, there were about 5,800 that I deemed to be readily exploitable. And this is only counting ones that had consistent observable ex or oracles. Um, of these, there were less than 1,000 that appeared to me to be like a known Poodle TLS vulnerability. There were about 1,000 of them that were Golden Doodle. And then the rest of them seemed to be Zombie Poodle. Um, when I extended my test tool and did some more scans, and this is meanwhile after three different public advisories had been released, Citrix F5 and Oracle, um, I found 129 discernible behaviors. And part of this is because I extended my validation for what kind of signals I was looking for. Like I added in some code to say, after we've sent our record and we've waited a little while, let's try and close the TLS session, which means writing onto the socket, which means that we're possibly going to get another error condition back that's going to reveal whether the session is still open or whether the remote peer has terminated it. Um, other improvements that I made, I had problems initially that I mentioned um, where there were edge cases around the MAC length for different uh, cipher suites, which could have caused me to miss some hosts. And I also extended out my test cases so that it wasn't just messing with the last block, but also throughout the packet. Uh, in the end, with this data set collected earlier this month, March 11th, 12th, there were nearly 8,000 domains with oracles, um, but I actually only classified about 3,689 of them about as observable. Um, and that means the other ones, a lot of them were encrypted TLS alerts, which means somebody might be able to exploit them, but it's going to take some JavaScript uh, Kung Fu or something. So Overall, we're looking at about 1.6% of the TLS-enabled Alexa top 100,000 sites having exploitable TLS padding oracles. And overall, there's about 1%. Um, this covers a lot of different important sites, like a couple US credit reporting agencies, several uh, government agencies, military organizations from around the world, lots of commerce sites and bill paying systems all sorts of things that somebody might actually want to attack. And another thing I want to draw your attention to here is 1.6%, this is for the top 100,000 versus 1% for all of them. That tells me that, again, just like with robot, the distribution is of vulnerable systems is heavier on the sites that are more popular, which is also probably meaning that these are the sites that are spending more money. And 
I'll let you make your own conclusions about that, but I feel that this says some things about uh, the value of some of these middle boxes and the quality of their implementations. So I'll also note there are a lot more hosts that are out there that are vulnerable. I have direct knowledge that another project is going to be revealing that as well. Um, some of the things that I missed, that I know that I missed kind of intentionally, uh, there are cases where a padding oracle is only going to exhibit if you select a certain protocol and a certain cipher. Um, my test was not doing that. My test was just connecting and using whatever preferences that the server had. The reason for this is that in reality, if somebody's going to exploit this, uh, it's going to be pretty unlikely that they're going to be able to force the selection of a particular cipher and protocol version at this point. So the most interesting cases are what the server's defaults are. Um, also, I want to note that I've got five test cases here. Uh, there are definitely a lot more things that you could do. Um, so there are trade-offs with that, though. I was using a $5 VPS machine to scan the internet in three days, two to three days. Wouldn't be able to do that if I was extending out this test so far. I also want to note something that I'm casually calling sleeping poodle, and that's basically that there's poodle TLS problems that um, they really are SSLv3 padding mode being used within the application data, but not in the handshake. So to understand this, you have to know that there's multiple protocols within the TLS protocol. You can check out my blog for more details on that. But basically, you can have a separate implementation for handshake and application data. And there are a number of hosts out there that seem to. So with these hosts, you could scan with my pad check tool, and you'll see that it says Poodle. But if you scanned with something like SSL Labs or some other uh, proper Poodle TLS test tool, it's not going to recognize that as vulnerable. So uh, the disclosures that have been going on. Um, as I mentioned, Citrix and F5 have both released advisories already. Um, each of these vendors had exposure for both Zombie Poodle and Golden Doodle, but it was predominantly Zombie Poodle that I was seeing with the Citrix hosts and predominantly Golden Doodle that I was seeing with the F5 hosts. But it's important to note F5 was by far not the biggest um, offender of Golden Doodle hosts. There are several other vendors um, that I have ongoing communications with who are trying to figure out whether or not it's their product or an IPS in line. So I'm kind of hoping that you guys will take the tool that I'm going to share with you at the end of today, scan your environments, and maybe open up tickets with vendors to help get some more patches out. Um, so there's also some things that I missed here because there are things that aren't going to be in the Alexa top sites. Um, for example, if you're talking about uh, home devices and VPN endpoints, these probably aren't going to end up on an internet top site list, but they could have very important vulnerabilities, especially these SSL VPN systems. So that's something that I haven't really had access to scan a lot of different vendors, and I would encourage other people to do that. Um, there's also, as I said, a lot more subtle checks that you can do. Like, there are problems that could be exploitable simply if a server is failing to validate just one Mac byte. Because if they fail to validate just one Mac byte, you might be able to use that as part of an Oracle. I had promised that uh, TLS 1.3 is going to save us all. So the reason for this is that there's only authenticated ciphers allowed in TLS 1.3. Um, I'm absolutely encouraging that anybody in here who manages a site, you need to stop using TLS CBC ciphers. This uh, Mac, then pad, then encrypt, it's not a good process. And really, um, moving to TLS 1.3 is a very good idea for a long time now, the TLS specifications have been driven too far by vendors and practitioners rather than actual cryptographers. And I feel that TLS 1.3 is really a sea change at this point, that um, it was driven by crypto cryptography and security and privacy rather than business needs and what's going to sell. I have some acknowledgments that I want to make. Uh, so Hanno Burke had inspired me to do this kind of work. Um, we had spoken after Black Hat, after the robot research, and 
talked about the different things that might still be out there, basically well-known crypto flaws that are still making their way on the internet. Uh, I also want to give a special thanks to Robert Mergit, Yuri Somorovsky, and Nimrod Avram. Um, these guys uh, did a really awesome project, which is going to be in the Usenix proceedings this year. And you can check out their repo um, is the bottom link there. And this top link is the repo for getting the pad check tool. And I've been told that they will also be releasing their tool today. I expect that it will end up on that bottom repo. And if everybody's copied down those links, I'm just going to give one more second. Okay, so now I have a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Somebody must have a question. I guess I did a very good job explaining everything then. Well, thank you everybody for your time then.